I think some key things for people to uh, look for when a wildfire starts is to try to find the best place to get the right information. Clearly your local government website is a great start and also our website bcwildfire.ca and our Facebook page. I think it's very important for folks to get the true facts, uh, know the source that they're coming from and make sure they're well in the loop from the beginning of the fire as it moves on through to the back end. When we post information about wildfire, it's certainly the most recent information. I think the challenge that people are faced with sometimes is not having instantaneous information minute by minute. There's a lot going on in a fire and we adjust our tactics moment by moment, hour by hour through the day. What they really need to focus on is what is the risk? What is the risk to them, their life, their property and their assets? When we have a wildfire that starts, you know, obviously life and Safety of our first responders is a top priority, life of the public as well, and the properties. We will be looking to make a recommendation to the local government. Now, how we do that is complex. We don't take those recommendations lightly at all. There's a lot of science and decision making that goes into it, including experience. We also look to local knowledge. We reach out to local people and communities all the time. Uh, they know what the winds are going to be like, what the fuels are like, where water might come from, and how this fire might move. We look to indigenous knowledge as well. It's very important for us. So there's a lot of science that goes into it, a lot of experience of our own staff and crews, and also a lot of experiences of local people and Indigenous communities that we really depend on to make those recommendations for orders and alerts. There are two types of evacuations that can occur during a wildfire. One is called a tactical evacuation, and that occurs when a fire crew goes out and they see a fire that is imminently threatening life and property. They have the legal purview to go and do a tactical evacuation. In other words, you should leave right now. That's type one. Type two is, uh, is a non-tactical evacuation where as a fire is growing and we're using that science that shows us there's a high risk to a particular area, we will make a recommendation to a local government that they should probably put an order or an alert in play. If we can't have people leave these areas, it impacts our ability to fight the wildfire. When our crews have to stop working to go help the public who've stayed behind, they are now not fighting wildfire. And when they're not fighting wildfire, those fires are going to grow. No life is worth risking for a wildfire. And when we see a high rank fire, um, extreme activity, wind driven fire, the best thing we can do in most cases is move people out of the way, including our crews. Our crews are people too, with lives and families. And just like the public, uh, there's no life worth risking for a wildfire. Aerial resources are a huge part of wildland firefighting. Most people in British Columbia, unfortunately, are getting used to seeing that, whether it's helicopters bucketing water onto a fire, air tankers applying retardant to cool and slow a fire, or water skimmers that are putting water directly onto the flames to cool it down. What is very challenging for us is when people get in the way. Um, if we have watercraft on lakes, our skimmers can't skim. When our skimmers can't skim, they can't cool the fire down, and our crews can't work hard to put the fire out. The fire then grows and impacts life and property potentially. That water that's being skimmed is going to a very important high level incident. The pilots that are flying these aircraft are uh, facing dangerous conditions and they're highly trained and they're ready to do that and they do it uh, well with professionalism. But if they can't move water to the fire, uh, things can become very drastic very quickly. Similarly, if you are flying a drone through an area, we will often have to ground our aircraft because we can't safely fly helicopters and air tankers when there's uncontrolled drones in our airspace. Most fires in British Columbia have a restricted airspace automatically placed over them. So not only is it illegal, but it really causes us challenges with suppression. Um, minutes can be important in a fire. When you're doing initial attack, it's so important to get the fire under control quickly. And if we have any delay at all from a drone, uh, a boat or public on a water body that we can't skim off of, or even having public in our area on our fire guards, on our fire lines, or in the forest where we're trying to work, we have to stop suppression activities and the fire can grow and cause risk to the public. When we are moving into a drought and higher uh, opportunity for fire behavior that's significant, we adjust our preparedness accordingly. Multiple times in a cycle, we're looking at the weather, the fuel, the wind, 
and what resources we do have available. And from that, it determines how many crews are on standby, how many decision makers are available, and what kind of shifts and hours they're gonna work. We will put initial attack crews on a very heightened level of standby where they're expected to be in their helicopter skids off the ground within five minutes. If it was cooler and wetter, we would lower that level of standby. We would often have double crews on standby to respond to some of these fires, which is exactly what is the case here in the South Okanagan during these kind of drought conditions. The goal for us is to try to catch these fires when they're very small. That's not news to anybody. If we can keep a fire small from the very beginning and avoid a large fire, we can avoid some of the catastrophes that we're seeing this year. And we'll try to do triage and put them in some sort of priority sequence so that we can move our crews out to the ones that we A, have the best chance of success on and B, have the best chance of uh, containing the fire so it doesn't risk life and property. When we are seeing fire behavior that's increased uh, in very high drought conditions, we can't go right in and put water right on the flame. That would be called direct attack, similar to what a fire department would do when a house is on fire. When we're dealing with wildland fire, creating a very extreme fire behavior, we have to stand back a little bit from the head of the fire. And the way we do that is we move back from the fire, which allows some unburnt fuel between the fire and where we are. We very methodically build guard line around the fire we add water to the guard line in the term of pump and hose, and we call that plumbing the line. Every now and then we build a large cleared area called a safe zone, where if fire was to come, our crews and equipment can move to that area, so they're safe, and we gradually work our way around the fire with a guard line. With the fuel between the guard line and the fire, we need to remove that fuel, and that's one of our most uh, successful tactics in fire suppression. As we're moving up the guard line, when conditions allow, when the humidity is just right and the winds are blowing in the right direction, the fuel is receptive to fire so that it's going to burn cleanly and remove the fuel. Our crews will use a drip torch uh, in some cases and they will burn off very small sections of that fuel and start removing the fuel between that nice safe guard line and the head of the fire. If you take the fuel away, the fire can't come to the guard line. We cannot afford any more human caused wildfires at all. They are 100% avoidable. We are very, very encouraged with the cooperation we get from the public. We can't thank them enough for their support. But as fire season drags on each year, the public can become fatigued, just like our fire crews are. That's very understandable. So we thank you for your continued support and cooperation.